Uh, this morning we will be devoted to exegesis, and exegesis is still very much uh, from the Judeo-Arabic period, and we'll be discussing Daniel Kumisi at first, and then Yefet Ben Eli, who, was, as I mentioned yesterday, would be one of the, one of the, one of the stars here. <laughs> The first uh, talk will be a joint presentation by Barry Walfish and Mira Polyak, uh, which is also indicative of the usefulness of cooperation uh, among scholars in the field of Karite studies. There's, because of the nature of the field, I think it lends itself well to such cooperation. I introduced Barry yesterday. Let me just say thank Mihira for coming under difficult circumstances. And uh, I don't think I need to uh, introduce Mihira either to this group, some of whom are his, her students. Uh, of the books, I did not bring her Karite Judaism book, because that's already an old book in the field. Uh, but we do have over there the joint edition that she and uh, Eliezer Schlossberg did of Yefet on Hosea. And now they'll be talking about uh, uh, Daniel Kumasi, a new edition, translation works of Daniel Kumasi, notes from a work in progress. How are we doing? Books translation? No. Okay. <laughs> This isn't uh, it's not crucial. So crucial. <laughs> not so, no. Oh yeah, there is a handout. Yeah, it's not so crucial. Uh, pass around. Okay. Daniel uh, Ben Moses Al Kumisi. Oh, oh, oh yeah, we don't need that until um, later. Uh, the, there's a handout. Uh, Can I take this down? Which, yeah, yeah. Should I change it? Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, the first slide didn't uh, line up so quickly. I mean, it's, it okay. I'll shut off at the top. Okay, okay. okay. But it's, uh, it's just the title. Um, okay. Okay. Um, Daniel Ben Moses Al Kumisi, who immigrated to Palestine uh, about 880 CE is now viewed as a seminal figure and important leader of early Karaism, credited with endowing the newly founded Karite sect with its chief characteristics, rejection of rabbinite oral law, promotion of immigration to the land of Israel, and ascetic mourning practices. But Daniel's importance extends beyond his role as Karite communal re leader. Daniel is credited with a number of firsts, as you see on the slide. He is first to produce anti-Rabbinite polemics. He's the first to critique the rabbinic use of anthropomorphism. His explanation of the Karite position on the meaning of Mimocharat Shabbat, the day after the Sabbath, as referring to the actual Sabbath day, and not Yom Tov, as the time uh, referred to in... Uh, in the uh, passage in, uh, in Leviticus uh, dealing with Pesach, uh, is the earliest to survive. And he is credited with appropriating the term Avele Sion, or mourners of Zion, for the Karaites. And he's also probably the first Jewish Mutazilite, Karite or otherwise. Daniel is also a crucial figure in the development of the most important literary genre in classical Judaism, a biblical commentary. Most general accounts of the, of the history of Jewish biblical exegesis begin with Sadia. Yet Daniel predates Sadia by at least a, 
generation, and he deserves credit for being the first biblical exegete to interpret the text in its historical and literary context. The importance of this development for Bible study in Judaism cannot be overstated. Classic rabbinic literature, Talmud and Midrash, approached the Bible as an organic whole in which relations could be found between disparate parts and connections made between biblical passages on the basis of association or alliteration without regard for the rules of language for the most, in, in most uh, cases. It was an atomistic approach which disregarded context and linguistic features of the text, but was very effective in conveying didactic and spiritual messages. In Islamic countries, scholarly interest in Arabic grammar and lexicography as applied to the Quran was soon taken up by Jewish scholars who applied these disciplines to the Hebrew language and the biblical text. The earliest Hebrew grammarians were 9th and 10th century Karaites of Persian origin, and with the new interest in Hebrew grammar and lexicography in the Islamic period, the commentary genre developed in order to explain the biblical text in its context while deciphering the meaning of the words systematically and scientifically. Daniel al Kumisi represents the missing link in the chain of development from grammar book and biblical glossary to commentary. He took the grammatical and linguistic teachings of his Persian compatriots along with his own insights and wove them into his commentaries in a seamless way, producing for the first time a new genre of literature, the scientific biblical commentary. Another one of Daniel's innovations was his attempt to determine the historical circumstances in which the events in the biblical text took place. This is especially significant for biblical prophecy, which could and sometimes was read as applying to the exegete's own period. Scriptural interpretation served as a vehicle for ideology, theology, philosophy, and moral and ethical values. It was also the medium through which Jewish sects and movements developed their identities, differentiated themselves from the other, and carried on their polemics with both insiders and outsiders, of various persuasions. Daniel's, com da Daniel's commentaries mark the beginning of a new phase in the history of Jewish biblical interpretation. Several factors have been suggested as major influences on the development of this new genre. Islamic influence is obvious. The early Karaites, Benjamin al-Nahawandi and Daniel and Yefet ben Eli and Yaqub al kirkisani lived in an Islamic milieu and were no doubt familiar with Islamic modes of study and thought. Trends in Quranic interpretation may have had some influences on Jewish modes of biblical interpretation. Islamic, especially Ismaili, influences on Daniel's commentaries can be detected. For example, in his Leviticus commentary, he refers to what is manifest and known and what is hidden and obscure in the biblical text, an obvious parallel to the doctrine of Zahir revealed and Batin concealed, which the Ismailis believed uh, applied to the Quran. Other scholars such as Naftali Vider, Yoram Erder, uh, Andre Paul, and Daniel Frank have pointed to similarities between the commentaries of Daniel as well as other Karite exegetes such as Yefet ben Eli and the Psharim produced by the Qumran Dead Sea community. They speak of Karite prognostic or Pesher exegesis, which bears a striking resemblance to Qumranic Sharim. They see if not a genetic link between the Qumran covenanters and the Karite sectarians, then at least an accidental link occasioned by the discovery of some of the former's works in a cave near the Dead Sea in the early 9th century. These works, such as the Damascus Covenant, are said to have influenced the ideas and methods of the Karaites. Haggai ben Shammai and Mira Paliak, however, have questioned these links. Mira Paliak prefers to see the emergence of charism and its literary project as a result of internal growth and development within the rabbinic community, with little or nothing to do with the ancient sectarians of Qumran. She also questions the use by Vider and, other, and others of Qumran terminology with respect to the exegesis of the Karaites. 
claiming that the type of exegesis of prophetic text that the Karaites engaged in was more akin to that of the rabbis in Midrashic works than of the Qumran texts. The latter read current events into the prophetic texts and identified specific individuals as objects of prophetic re revelations, while the Karaites found contemporary relevance in the words of the prophets, but in more general descriptive and prescriptive terms. Daniel's historical exegesis of prophetic texts is even more remarkable since these texts could easily have been used for polemical sectarian purposes. And not to say that he never did, but he often uh, really sticks to the, uh, to the historical uh, uh, context. A guy Ben Shammai has recently written of Daniel al Kumisi. In general, despite the pivotal role played by al Kumisi in early Karaism, his works have not received the attention they deserve, and a comprehensive monographic work devoted totally to this seminal figure is still a desideratum. Daniel's written work is thus of utmost significance, yet while his works have been studied and used by scholars, to a greater or lesser extent, they have never been gathered together and subjected to systematic and sustained analysis. It is uh, our goal to fill this gap by gathering together this unique body of exegetical work along with Daniel's other works, translating and analyzing them in order to better clarify the religious and intellectual context in which they were created and to evaluate the importance of Daniel as a religious leader and innovator and as a trailblazer in the field of biblical exegesis. Uh, the project has three goals. I think the next, the next slide. Yeah. Uh, first, compiling all the works of Daniel and editing them in a reliable, accurate edition. Second, producing an English translation of the same. <clears throat> and third, providing an introduction which will situate these works in their proper historical and literary context. Up to now, the most progress has been made on the preparation of the text. All of the known works by Kamisi have been produ produced in electronic form by our graduate assistants, Nechamit Perry and uh, Dana Bracha Biederman, who have done an excellent job and continue working on the preparation of the edition. Pretty much all of the texts have been published already in various fora. Some are in better shape than others. Wherever possible, we are going back to the original manuscripts, many of them Ganesa fragments, to ensure the accuracy of the transcription. And here's a, a list of the works uh, attributed uh, to Daniel al Kumisi. So first we have commentaries, and these are all fragmentary. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Minor Prophets, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, and Daniel. Uh, in addition, there are fragments of his Sefer Mitzvot Agadol, the Sefer Mitzvot, his Book of Commandments, and the text of a Zionist sermon or creed occur to the Karite diaspora urging them to make Aliyah to Jerusalem, to mourn for the temple and pray for its restoration. Finally, there are fragments of a Mutazilite work, Kitab al-Tawhid, on the unity of God, which were prepared by Moshe Tzuker and published in his uh, Al-Targum, <coughs> Rav Sadia Gaon La Torah. Most of the commentaries are fragmentary, the most substantial being the commentary on the minor prophets, which is only missing the introduction, if there was one, and the first six verses of the commentary. This commentary was edited by Isaac uh, Dovber Marcon, who died in 1949 without seeing it to publication. It was subsequently prepared for publication by Ephraim Urbach and David Svi Banet, and published in 1957. Uh, in the uh, series uh, published by Mikitse Nir Damim. Marcon's edition is fairly minimalist. The text notes biblical verses cited, gives cross-references within the commentary, cites deviations from the Masoretic text, 
makes necessary emendations and explains the Arabic glosses. However, what the edition lacks is a proper introduction to place Kumisi and his commentary in their proper historical and socio-religious context, or even to put the commentary in the context of the rest of Kumisi's work. Svian Kori, in his review of Marquand's edition, laments the lack of, intro of an introduction and more detailed footnotes, and suggests that this would diminish the use made of the commentary by scholars in other fields who would not appreciate its significance. He even questioned the wisdom of publishing it in such a minimalist fashion, suggesting that it would delay the publication of a full edition with proper apparatus. Indeed, it has survived over 50 years and been used, but probably not as much as it could have been. Whence the need for a new edition? The other fragments of Kumisi's works have been edited by scholars over the span of much of the 20th century, beginning with Schechter's edition of Leviticus Fragments in 1903 and ending with Ben Shammai's edition and translation of Daniel Fragments in 1981 and uh, published with translation in 1991. The bringing together of all of Kamisi's work in one volume with all the texts edited uniformly will facilitate further research on this seminal figure and help contextualize the Minor Prophet's commentary as well. Very little of Kamisi's work has been translated. Marquand translated a few passages from the Minor Prophet's commentary into German, and Ben Shemaya and Nimoy have published translations of Daniel fragments. Other than that, translations of other short sections have appeared in articles and books by Naftali Vider, Meir Apoliak, and others. The sermon was published in English by Leon Nimoy in an article in the Proceedings of the American Academy for Jewish Research. Having the entire corpus available in English will make it available to a much broader range of scholars interested in medieval exegesis, charism, and its links with the Dead Sea Scrolls. As of today, I've drafted several sections of the translation of the Minor Prophets commentary, but, but much still needs to be done. The, the task of translation will probably be the most difficult of all, since many of Kumisi's comments are obscure in the extreme and almost defy comprehension. Furthermore, the gaps in many of the fragments make translation extremely difficult. However, if, if it can be done for the Dead Sea Scrolls, presumably we'll be able to produce something that is comprehensible and more accessible than the original. This is our goal. <laughs> Arab, no, Arabic losses. There are quite a number of Arabic losses in the commentary. In addition, Kumisi's style is heavily influenced by Arabic. Uh, this part of the edition and the discussion of the whole issue of Arabic losses I'll leave to Meira, who will uh, comment on that uh, after my presentation. The final stage of the project will involve producing a proper critical apparatus with more extensive notes, which help clarify exegetical, polemical, and philosophical issues in the commentaries and other texts. The introduction will bring all of this information together in a coherent fashion. Context. One of the jobs of the introduction will be to contextualize Kumisi and his historical situation, both within the Jewish community and the wider Islamic society in which he was raised. Looking back, the whole issue of the relation of Kumisi's exegesis to the Dead Sea Scrolls will have to be revisited. For the study of Kumisi in his own period, the proliferation of studies of early Karite grammar and exegesis by many of the scholars attending this conference and their colleagues will facilitate the carrying out of this task. The studies of Jeffrey Kahn and other grammarians on early Karite grammar will help clarify Kumisi's influences and con contributions in this field. The exegetical studies of Chagai ben Shemai, Mira Paliak, Eliezer Schlossberg, and Miriam Goldstein, and others on Yefet, Yusuf ibn Nuh, Salmon, and other exegetes will make it easier to situate Daniel in his proper exegetical context and to gain a better appreciation of his exegetical accomplishments. It would also be possible to study his influence on later generations of Karite exegetes. 
to the best of my knowledge, he was not known to the rabbinite community. Now we get to the uh, handout, which provides a sample of the edition as well as the, uh, a draft uh, of a translation of uh, Kumisi's commentary on Hosea uh, chapter 6, verses 8 to 9. It is a useful example to demonstrate his uh, exegetical method. Um, <laughs> Al Kumisi explains uh, the verse uh, Gilad is a city of evil doers, as applying to the town of Yavesh Gilad, which, according to Judges twenty one eight, did not respond to the general call to arms following the appalling uh, rape murder incident of the concubine of Giva. The prophet says Al Kumisi compares Israel in his own day to the evil doers of Yavesh Gilad. His interpretation of the phrase Akubamidam is especially innovative. The phrase is difficult because the connection between Akuba and Dam is not clear. Rashi and others place it in the context of bandits lying in ambush and shedding innocent blood, citing uh, Joshua 8.13, the, the et akevo miyam la'ir, and uh, Esau's complaint about uh, Jacob, la'ya'akveni ze pa'amayin. Radak cites the sages who connect Akuba to Okva in 2 Kings 10.19, the Yehu asa be'okva, meaning this, uh, Yehu, uh, Yehu uh, acted deceitfully in order to shed blood. Kumisi also connects Akuba with Okva, or cunning, uh, or deceit. Badam, he explains, as alluding to Basar Badam, or people, and the Mem is the Mem of comparison. Gilad is more deceitful than other people. This interpretation may seem a bit forced, but it shows a thoughtful exegete grappling with a difficult text, which is none of, none of the interpretations really uh, explain it satisfactory, in a satisfactory manner. Thus far, we have two levels of meaning for Gilad, the wicked men of Yavesh Gilad and the wicked Israelites of the prophet Hosea's day. In the next verse, Kumisi applies the verse to his own uh, time. The opening phrase, Uch ke ish gedudim, is usually translated as troops of robbers wait for a man. Seeing chake as deriving from the <coughs> verb meaning to wait, chaka, or the chakot. Kumisi offers another interpretation of this word, deriving it from the word meaning a fisherman's hook, chaka, and explains the phrase to mean like manhooks are the gangs. Like hooks meant to catch a fish, the gangs of evildoers are gathered together against the man, the ordinary Israelite, to trap him in a snare, to cause Israel to stray, from the true path. The next phrase is usually translated a band of priests, Hever Kohanim, who murder on the road to Shechem. Kumisi, thinking of his own time, asks why a band of priests, and answers because they were the teachers of Israel. And today, false leaders, Roim, shepherds, have risen who lead astray like murderers on the road standing in roads, or shoulder to shoulder, shem shem. So it's, it's shechma, you know, it's not shechma, it's shechma. So he sees it as coming from shechem, uh, which is a shoulder, or he also uh, explains it as standing together, closely together in rows. Um, so he doesn't uh, apply it to shechem at all, which 
which is uh, different from most exegetes. This uh, last comment, besides its linguistic innovation, also introduces a contemporizing element, comparing the evildoers and false leaders of Hosea to the author's ideological components who he, opponents who he sees as leading the people astray. We find in this example several unusual interpretations. Some of them were taken up by exegetes in the next generation, such as Sadia and Yefet. But what's exciting about Kamisi is the fact that it, that it all basically begins with him. He was the first exegete to examine the text with the eye of an interpreter concerned with language, meaning, and context. The question remains as to whether these types of comments fall into the category of prognostic exegesis, reading the text as a code to be deciphered and applied to the present, as scholars such as Vieter have claimed, or whether these are merely applications of the text by the author in more general terms in a manner similar to that of the rabbis, as Miro Poliak would argue. It is hoped that careful analysis of passages such as these will highlight all Khamisi's uh, exegetical singularity and will also help resolve the issue of the nature of his and other Karaites' applications of the biblical text to their situation. To conclude, the Khamisi project is meant to raise the profile of this seminal figure of early Karai Judaism and bring his work to the attention of a wider audience. And I welcome the comments and advice of this learned forum. Thank you.